Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Fernandes. I'm the Medicare Sales Manager at Health New England. Tonight, I'm joined by Sue Fontaine, the Bay State Senior Class Coordinator at Bay State Health, and Dr. Leslie Linus from Bay State Neurosurgery. We're here this evening for a great presentation called Oh My Aching Back. I wanted to let you know that all of our participants are muted upon entry into the webinar. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, at the bottom or top of your screen, you should see a tab that says Q&A. To ask a question, just click on the Q&A tab and type your question in. We will answer questions periodically throughout the presentation and we'll review them at the end of the presentation as well. We hope you enjoy this evening presentation. Dr. Linus, I'll turn it over to you. Hi everybody, I'm Leslie. I'm one of the neurosurgeons at Bay State. Um, I've been a neurosurgeon for about eight years, but new to Bay State um, about a year ago. So I just wanted to review some things about back pain. This is um, mostly going to be about low back pain uh, because neck pain is a little different uh, and everything's a little bit different when it comes to neck pain. So this will be mostly about low back pain. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, please type any questions that you have and we'll get to them as soon as we possibly can. Uh, hopefully I'll answer a lot of them for you. Uh, but if not, we'll stop and I'll be able to answer them. So back pain. Uh, just some bullet points on some general things about back pain. It's a leading cause of disability in, across the entire world. So uh, millions and millions of people have back pain. And it's the most common reason for people to go to the doctors. Um, so almost everyone, about 80% uh, of the population, worldwide population, has back pain at least once in their lives. And I actually think the number's probably higher. Um, so at one point in your entire life, um, you'll have back pain. And I'm pretty sure most of us have all had back pain at least once in our lives. And the last point there is that that's $100-$200 billion a year that uh, the economy sees in terms of the cost of back pain. Most of that comes from lost wages, which means you'll have back pain bad enough that'll put you out of work. Um, and that's pretty significant. So, um, so those are some of the epidemiologic statistics for back pain. Um, so you're not alone. <laughs> Almost everybody has back pain in this world. Uh, is, next slide, please. So these are the risk factors for back pain. There are a couple of things that you can't do anything about and a lot of things you can do something about. Uh, age is something you can't do anything about. Around 40 years old, the spine starts to degenerate. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Just like we get wrinkles and things start to droop and sag and our hair goes gray, that's part of the normal aging process. And so the discs that are the shock absorbers for the spine, the bones, the joints, the ligaments, the tendons, all of those things start to age and not quite work properly like they were when we were 20. And so that's important to know that as you age, your spine is going to start to get old, just like the rest of our body, and maybe not work so well. Other risk factors for back pain is a lack of exercise. So if you don't use the muscles and the ligaments and the joints, then there's a probability that if you do some sort of movement, perhaps something that you've always done, carry a bag of potatoes or shovel the snow, that that general lack of exercise will result in muscles and ligaments and discs that haven't seen that exercise in a while or that activity, and so they might not work properly when you start to use them. 
excess weight. The spine is made to, the lumbar spine, the low back, is made to support our weight. Um, they're bigger bones, they're bigger shock absorbers, and they're meant to hold the weight of the body. And if you put too much weight on, then it'll start to deteriorate. If you think of it as maybe a hip joint, let's say, or a knee joint, a lot of weight on the knee is not tolerated well, and it can start to break down, and you can get arthritis and maybe need a knee replacement surgery. And the same thing can happen to the spine. Too much weight uh, will really strain uh, the components of the back, and the spine was not meant to hold more than about 200 to 250 pounds smoking. Um, there's a lack of oxygen and all the um, uh, molecules that will help with healing. So smoking is not good for the spine in general. Inflammation, um, anything that puts your body uh, in an inflammatory process. So that can be disease, infection, um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus, some of those um, um, diagnoses that give your body general inflammation can be a risk factor. And we all know improper lifting um, can be a way that will give you some back pain if you're um, using your back to lift and not your legs, that can put a lot of strain on the spine. And then something that most people don't pay attention to, but if, if you're depressed, um, we're all kind of depressed with this COVID pandemic because um, things aren't normal for us, that can sort of exacerbate your back pain. It's just a feeling of um, not wanting to do things, low motivation, you might not exercise, you mo might smoke more, you might put excess weight on. Some of those things can be a contributor for back pain. Um, next slide, please. Causes of back pain. Um, Any time in medicine that we're looking for causes of anything, these, this is the list of things that we go through, which is, could it be a tumor causing back pain? Could it be trauma? You fell and broke a bone. Um, inflammation, I've underlined, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, infection, uh, infection can enter into the spine and the disc and cause pain. And then vascular, meaning the blood vessels. So a very, very rare cause of back pain, but it can be. Inflammation is really uh, what we all think of with back pain, and that's um, where the joints or the ligaments get spastic or um, irritated. Um, they cause an inflama inflammatory process in the entire spine, and it can lead to pain. Things like degenerative spine conditions are, or arthritis are an inflammatory process. Next slide. Components that can cause back pain. Um, these are all the things that are in your back that can give you back pain. So uh, we talked about tumor or trauma. Um, tumor obviously can, but tumor will affect one of these things that can lead to, to joint pain or trauma can affect one of these things that can lead to back pain. So obviously there are a lot of muscles in the back. Um, every um, vertebral body, there are five of them in the low back, 12 of them in the mid back, and seven of them in the neck. Um, each one of those levels has a joint on the right side and the left side. So there are multiple joints in the back, and any one of them can cause back pain if it gets inflamed. Obviously, there are ligaments um, and tendons. Uh, tendons um, link muscles to bone, and ligaments connect bone to bone. So those are things that can get irritated or injured. Obviously the bone can break and give you back pain. Uh, the discs, which are the shock absorbers of the spine can herniate or rupture and that can uh, pinch off nerves that can cause you back pain. Next slide. We uh, talk about back pain, whether it's acute or chronic. So acute means less than six weeks in duration and chronic back pain is greater than three months. 
six weeks, um, th that's when you really, uh, that will be something where you turn or twist the wrong way, you fall, um, and then the pain that you have in those first six weeks can be acute. People can have those issues and then over time develop chronic back pain. And that would be something that um, we see more with the degenerative conditions, conditions like spinal stenosis or um, some degenerative changes in the spine as we age. Next slide. So before I go into some of the anatomy, um, let me just see if there are any questions that we want to answer. Um, so, uh, Sarah or Sue, do you want me to just read these and go through them, or how do you want me to do this? Sure, if you're okay with that, or we can read them to you, whatever works. Yeah, no, I can read them. That's fine. So Sharon has asked. Okay. Yeah, what does it mean if the toes and the foot are tingly? Um, well, <laughs> uh, you know, that goes into um, multiple reasons, right? So um, that's not really back pain. That has to do with um, whether there are problems in the toes themselves. Is it a nerve problem? Is it a blood vessel problem? So um, it's hard to know if you know, what the issue is. Um, there are multiple questions to answer. It could be a nerve. It could be blood vessels. It could be um, diabetic neuropathy, which is that the sugar um, uh, in the body is too high and it starts to um, uh, attack the nerves. So it could be a bunch of things um, when your toes and feet are tingly. So it's really hard to answer in a lecture on, on general back pain. Um, next um, is, uh, I'll read it to everybody. I have mild to moderate L3 degeneration. Can degeneration be slowed with exercise? Can the L3 degeneration uh, be causing my right sacral hip pain? X-rays, MRIs did not reveal a problem with sacral hip area. So mild to moderate degeneration, that's something we'll get into. Um, and again, not for this lecture, but um, for a detailed lecture on spinal stenosis or a particular uh, diagnosis. Uh, just because you have mild to moderate degeneration does not necessarily mean it's causing the problem. Um, so it's hard to, to know what the problem is. Can degenerations be slowed with exercise? Um, not really exercise. Like I talked about those risk factors for back pain, um, things that can slow degeneration are to stop smoking, to lose weight, to lift properly, um, to have good posture. Uh, can it be slowed with exercise? Probably yes, if you don't normally exercise. So if you don't normally exercise, you want to start now, it may slow the, the degeneration process. Um, can L3 degeneration cause your right sacral hip pain? It's really hard for me to answer that right now. I, I have to look at the images and things like that. Um, the, in the context of this lecture, if you have L3 degeneration, what's going on with the joints and the ligaments at that level? Um, are they pulling or, or irritating um, other um, ligaments or muscles in the sacral hip area? Uh, so that's, again, very hard to answer without knowing what else is going on. Um, just because the x-ray and the MRI don't reveal any problems with the sacral hip area, um, then it's, you never know if it's causing the trouble. You have to go see sort of a specialist to have them look at films and things like that. So um, I, I'm not sure if I answer a lot of those to your um, um, liking, but that's the best I can do sort of right now without um, getting into the particulars. Uh, the next question, do waist trimmer belts help with back pain? Um, I have to admit, I have no idea. Um, that's not something I routinely tell people to do. Uh, if they have back pain, um, the best treatment for back pain, if you're looking to trim your waist, is to lose the weight um, to get the pressure off the spine. Um, and then the last question I have here uh, for myself right now is, can foods that cause inflammation cause back pain? Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, anything that causes inflammation, like we talked about at the beginning of the lecture, 
Anything that causes inflammation can make any other inflammatory process worse. So one of the treatments for arthritis is an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, so that might be something you could talk to your primary care about. If you decrease the inflammation in the body that is caused by certain foods, then of course you can um, decrease any kind of back pain or any other uh, pain in the body that is related to a general inflammatory process. Okay, so there are there are all the questions I have now at this time. Let me see if I find another one. Um, yep, here are a lot more. Uh, your back stiffens when you sit for any length of time with great pain to stand. Um, I'm not sure what the question is, um, but uh, that's very, very common for people with arthritis, which is um, overgrown joints. You've all seen people with big knobby knuckles that don't move their uh, hands very well or it hurts to open a jar. Same thing can happen in the back. There are all those little joints that can get inflamed and irritate. They don't work well. They don't move well. And sitting for long periods of time, standing for long periods of time can just create the pain. And especially when you go from sitting to standing. Um, and when you get up and stand and walk three or four steps and it goes away, that's typically arthritis. There's not a whole lot to do with that except maybe an anti-inflammatory diet or um, some anti-inflammatories. Can spinal stenosis be addressed with microsurgery? Yeah, the answer is yes. I'll just leave it at that. And can someone with osteoporosis have spinal surgery? Absolutely, uh, you can, but you're gonna have to talk to your spine surgeon about what the risks are because you may have increased risk of having some um, complications from the surgery or some more degeneration in time because of the, excuse me, osteoporosis. Um, I have some severe pain in the leg uh, from the hip down to the butt and the thighs and the lower extremities. Um, I, again, I'm not sure what the question is, um, but uh, again, it goes to um, something where you'd have to talk to your primary care. Um, someone has to know whether, uh, where the pain is exactly, uh, how long you've had it for, um, and the mechanism of how you injured yourself. And those are the things that the primary care can um, determine whether that sounds like a disc, does it sound like something else, um, and then uh, do a workup from there. Uh, okay, so there are all the questions that I have. I hope that helped. Uh, we'll proceed with the um, lecture. And uh, hopefully I can answer some more of these questions as, uh, as we go. So uh, here's a picture of the anatomy. Uh, the low back is the lumbar area. That's sort of that turquoise color. And like I said, there are five bones in there. Um, and you can see that uh, each one of those little bones, if you can see them, um, has a joint on the right and a joint on the left. And so multiple um, areas for the, for the uh, joints to be irritated, um, as we talked about with arthritis. Next slide. So this point, obviously, you don't need to know this. Um, I guess I did when I was in medical school, uh, but not so much anymore now, all those little muscles. Um, but the anatomy of the low back, the point I wanted to show you all here is that there are um, many, many muscles that attach to the low back, that if there's a sprain or a strain or a bruise or a tug or a twist, that every single one of these muscles, even if just one of them gets irritated, can cause uh, an exacerbation of that inflammatory process we talked about, or um, can cause pain in and of themselves. And so there are muscles that attach the ribs to the hips. Um, there are muscles that attach each individual bone in the back to the hip. There are, and I'll show you later, there are tiny little muscles between every single bone in the back. Um, and then they all attach to the pelvis and the sacrum. Um, and so you can see where it makes it pretty hard to diagnose low back pain. There are lots of things that are going on there. Uh, and so um, 
it's really, really hard for the primary cares and your, and your providers sometimes to figure out what truly is going on. And just because we can't necessarily pinpoint it quickly or easily uh, doesn't mean it's not there. It just means it's really, really hard to figure out sometimes where your back pain is coming from. Next slide. So I guess you can't see very well, unfortunately, but that um, lower left picture, um, the, the small picture over on the right side, that's to show you that at each level, you have two or three little muscles that go from top to bottom. You have those angled muscles that attach one bone to the next bone up. Um, and you can kind of see the same thing over on the right side. So all these tiny, tiny little muscles so that if you get twisted the wrong way or the muscles not quite working right, can really cause a lot of trouble. Um, and then there's that over on the right picture, there's that big muscle that comes down the back um, that attaches to the very, very bottom of the um, sacrum, um, which is part of the pelvic bones. And so you can have pain that goes from the middle of the back and all the way down into the sacrum. Um, and there's not a whole lot to do for muscle pain other than some physical therapy or stretching or heat and things like that. Um, and sometimes that doesn't even work. So it, it get, can get to be very difficult to treat and to diagnose. Uh, next slide. Uh, this just shows you all the ligaments. So you saw all the muscles and now you get to see all the individual ligaments. Um, the biggest ones, that iliolumbar ligament, um, that's the second down from the top. Um, that's a ligament that connects the bottom two bones to the hip. Um, and, and those can be, if they get torn or scarred or uh, inflamed, they can really cause you a lot of hip and low back pain. And the other thing that I want to point out is what's called that sacroiliac ligament. That's a ligament that attaches the pelvic bones down to where you sit. Um, and look at how thick and broad that is. That's encompassing pretty much the entire left and right side um, and so that's a big ligament. And again, if you were to fall or have some trauma and you tear something down there, it can cause back pain that cannot be diagnosed on an MRI. We can't see micro tears in that ligament. It doesn't show up on an x-ray, won't show up on a CAT scan. And then you have back pain with no imaging study that tells you what's wrong. And so that can be something that again, is very hard to diagnose and again, very hard to treat. Next slide. Um, I think this might be the last anatomy slide and then um, we'll get into some questions again. Um, so this again, uh, just shows you the bones of the low back, um, the vertebral body, there are five of them in the low back and there's a disc that's the shock absorber in between. Um, and then that facet joint, facet is just a fancy name for the joint that we have in the low back. Um, and that's where one bone connects to the other and where the spine does all its bending. It bends forward, it bends back, it rotates from side to side, <clears throat> and it can bend from side to side. So you can have multiple um, directions of movement at each and every one of those joints. Remember the muscles that attach to each and, any one of, each and every one of those areas. And remember the ligaments that attach to all of those bones and muscles. Um, and you find out how complex the spine really is. That little yellow thing that's coming out of the, um, uh, uh, between the bones here, that's your nerve root. Um, that's where the nerve comes and leaves the spinal cord and goes out to the leg or the foot. If there's a herniated disc or an overgrown joint, um, you can see how it would um, press on that nerve and can cause nerve pain and leg pain. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's answer some questions. Uh, there's a question about, can a dietitian help you with the proper foods to decrease inflammation and manage back pain? You're looking for a specialist in this area to help. Absolutely. So 
Um, you can contact um, your uh, dietitian through Bay State or your primary care. Um, that's a referral to a dietitian. Um, and just ask them for, you want to get rid of your back pain and you're looking for some sort of anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, most of them honestly are, for the most part, low sugar diets. Um, so that's something that if you're not quite ready for a dietitian, you could just um, think about what your food intake is um, and see how much sugar you really have in your diet. And I'm not talking about like sugar from apples and, you know, fruit and things like that. That's just a uh, refined sugar, like you find in candies and, you know, donuts and things like that. Or if you put it in your tea or your coffee, um, so those kinds of things. So think about decreasing that. You could see after, and you have to give it a good three weeks um, for the diet to start to take effect <clears throat> and try that. Caffeine, um, you'd have to check an, your caffeine intake as well to see if um, you take a lot of caffeine in and you might want to consider cutting caffeine out of the diet. Um, and then obviously the dietitian will tell you more about each individual food. Um, there are, as you know, foods that are really good for inf inflammation. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids you might find in salmon, they're really good. Um, and the dietitian can tell you some more about those kinds of things that are actually better for you than just cutting something out. They'll add something to your diet. Um, your low back pain and right SI hip pain is not getting better. You stretch and exercise daily, right? So you're in the chronic uh, back pain category. Sacroiliac hip is really not quite back. It's the sacroiliac and the hip area. Sacro and we're going to get into a sacroiliac joint dysfunction a little bit later on in the lecture. Um, but that's, uh, and I don't have it um, in this, but... Um, it's really hard to get rid of sacroiliac hip and joint stuff. is really, really difficult to get, to get rid of. Uh, once you get it, it can be just, um, um, take a long time to get better and you have to do a little bit of everything. Stretching and exercise is part of it. Uh, maybe anti-inflammatory diets that we talked about, um, potentially injections into the joint, like somebody might get a hip injection or a shoulder injection for um, inflammation. You might need an injection into the joint. Uh, <clears throat> chiropractors can um, sometimes put the joint back in place. You have to find a chiropractor that does SI joint uh, manipulation. Um, and, uh, and sometimes the pool can really help getting in the pool and, and um, allowing the legs and the hip and the back to not have the weight on it. And that way you can move the hip around and the back around a little bit uh, easier. Um, can taking collagen help repair and lessen the pain? Um, <clears throat> not in the spine that we know of. I know that's something that the orthopedic guys talk about with the hips and the knees and the things like that. Um, but there's been no study that says collagen is helpful for the spine. Um, it may be. <clears throat> it's probably... Um, low risk to take it to see if it helps, but there's been no study in the literature that collagen helps with back pain. Uh, okay, so uh, back to the lecture here, acute back pain. Uh, we talked about that a little bit uh, before, it's less than six weeks, mostly comes from trauma or an acute dis, uh, disc herniation or overuse, you know, you're gardening or shoveling the snow, <clears throat> you don't normally do it, and then your back hurts the next day. excuse me, that is rarely surgical um, for the acute back pain. Um, and the reason it is rarely surgical is because one, we don't know what it is. You saw all the little things that it could be. And so three or four days after you get your back pain, uh, we still don't know what it is. Um, your entire back hurts. Uh, it could be a disc. It could be a, a muscle. It could be a ligament. It could be a bone. So we don't know what it is. Um, and so <clears throat> we don't operate on that within a week or so because we don't know what it is. Um, uh, next, next slide. 
chronic back pain. Uh, we've had somebody that's asked a bunch of questions about some sacroiliac and hip things. Um, that's what that would be. She's tried everything and nothing's really helping. Um, <clears throat> and you get into this chronic back pain category. Um, degenerative conditions can cause it. So like we said, the aging process, um, <clears throat> the discs lose their water content over time. <clears throat> the bones start to get a little osteoporotic and maybe collapse a little bit. The ligaments uh, stretch out over time. The muscles aren't quite strong as they were when we were 20. <clears throat> All that can lead to some chronic uh, back pain. Um, lack of exercise can certainly cause chronic back pain. So you're, you don't exercise very much, and then all of a sudden you go to shovel the snow, and now your back hurts. Being overweight, we talked about that before. That's a, a, a major risk factor. It doesn't mean that if you're overweight, you're going to have back pain but it's a major risk factor for chronic back and depression we talked about. Again, rarely surgical. And the reason it's rarely surgical when it's chronic back pain is that <clears throat> after uh, somewhere in between that acute back pain and chronic back pain, you've had some imaging studies, you've seen the spine specialist. And if there was surgical at that time, you would be on the path to potential surgery. If it's not surgical between the six weeks and three months, <clears throat> then it may never be surgical. Um, and so that's where we see a lot of this chronic back pain that we don't have an answer for sometimes. Next slide. Okay, here it comes. I'm sorry, I'm drinking because I'm getting a little sore throat here. Now, what do you do for your acute back pain? Uh, Next slide. <clears throat> so this is what you do when you shovel the snow or you twist the wrong way. Um, and you all probably know this, um, but this is the best thing to do. First of all, you have to rest, right? So <clears throat> if you're up on the roof and you're doing uh, roofing and uh, you uh, injure your back, then probably the next day you shouldn't you know, put the siding up on the house or sit in the car for 40 hours or something like that. You need to sort of rest and take care of yourself. <clears throat> and any little twinge that you're not used to, you know, as we get older in our 50s and the 60s, we all think we can do the same thing we did when we're 20. And the body's just not ready for that. Or it is, but it's got these degenerative conditions going on that make it a little more difficult to do what you used to do. And so you need to rest when you feel a little twinge. And ice. Ice for the first 72 hours is, the, is your best friend, really. Um, decrease the inflammation immediately with the ice. And whatever area your back hurts, put that on there. Um, and anytime you have chronic back pain and you get a little bit of a flare, you should use the ice. Um, and then just to decrease the inflammatory process, you can take anti-inflammatories. That's over-the-counter Advil, Aleve, Naproxen, Motrin, any of those ibuprofens are anti-inflammatories. If you can rest <clears throat> and ice um, in the first 24 to 48 hours, you're significantly, most of the time, significantly going to decrease the cascade we know as the inflammatory response. And that's something that can get worse over three days if you let it go. And so if you can really, really be aggressive in terms of your acute treatment, of your acute back pain, you're gonna do yourselves a favor three days from now. Ice, <clears throat> you should truly really ice every hour uh, until you got to get up and do something, go to bed or uh, whatever you need to do, pick up the kids, whatever. Um, so ice every hour as much as you can for those first three hours. It gets a little annoying after a while, but Icing just once really isn't going to help significantly. You truly have to ice almost every hour as best as you can while awake for the first uh, 24 hours. And that can really, really decrease the, the inf inflammation. 
Other things that you can consider that you'll probably talk to your uh, primary care about when it comes to that would be muscle relaxers. They're um, prescription strength um, medications you can get. Uh, steroids are super duper anti-inflammatories. So really, really um, decrease the inflammatory cascade. Heat after 72 hours, that's really good for chronic back pain. Um, and then physical therapy. So either stretching or massage or uh, something like that where um, you um, have someone else kind of do some of the things that you can't do, right? So you might not be able to kind of move your leg in a way that would stretch out a muscle if you did it yourself, but someone else can move the leg in a way that can actually stretch that muscle. The important thing about physical therapy is that sometimes um, it's too soon, right? You don't want to injure your back and then on the second day of your injury, go to the physical therapist. It's too soon. It's too uh, inflamed. You have to let that die down. So usually about 10 days to two weeks is that acute process. Um, most of the time it's about three weeks. Um, my dad always told me whenever I complained when I was a kid, I complained to my dad about whatever. And he said, uh, he didn't ask what it was or what happened. All he said is said, it'll get better in three weeks. And, you know, I kind of moaned and groaned and pouted and cried. And, um, but the truth was that he was right. Almost everything got better in three weeks. It might not have gone away, but it got significantly better in three weeks. And so that's something that I uh, take with me today, which is if I have one of these acute exacerbations, I ice, I rest, I get the anti-inflammatories. And if it's not better in three weeks, then I know maybe there's something more going on than just a you know, pulled muscle or <clears throat> torn ligament or something like that. Um, I got a question. Can icy hot packs help with chronic back pain and sacral pain? Absolutely. Um, um, you, they're low risk. Um, it's not surgery. It's not an invasive procedure. It's not a medication that has side effects. Um, they're things that you can get over the counter. And what I tell my patients is try it. Try it for a couple of days or uh, two or three times. And if it helps, continue to do it. If you try it and it doesn't help at all, then you've tried it and you've um, 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 it, taken that out of your equation of things that can potentially help you. <clears throat> so there are many different types of icy hot patches and packs at the pharmacy. There's pain lotions and creams and all that kind of stuff. Um, the downside to those is the expense to pay for them. But um, other than that, um, if you find something that works, then, um, then, then that's good. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, acute pack. Okay, so when to call your primary care. Um, like we talked about, no improvement or worsening after one to two weeks. So I talked about that two to three week thing that my dad sort of made us all do when we were kids um, that helped me get through my childhood and teenage years without any cost or problem to my parents. Um, but uh, no improvement or worsening after one to two weeks. And this is assuming you've rested, you've iced, and you've taken, taken some anti-inflammatory. Um, if you haven't done any treatment for your um, um, injury, <clears throat> then perhaps it will get worse over time. Um, but if you're trying to do the best you can with resting and icing and things like that, and it continues to get worse um, over 10 days or so, then you really should call your primary care. Most of the time, the pain won't improve in two to three weeks. We just talked about that. Most of the time, not always. Here are the things your primary care provider may do after a, a couple of weeks. Um, they might get x-rays if they, if it may was a trauma and they're looking for a broken bone, they might get x-rays. Um, muscle relaxers, they may prescribe you a muscle relaxer if they think it's a muscle problem. The steroids we talked about, that would be something that's a super duper anti-inflammatory that could really decrease the inflammatory cascade. And they might order some physical therapy for you. 
<clears throat> if you're still in the acute back pain period um, and you're sort of in that three week to sort of six week mark, these are reasonable things that you and your primary care can expect to do to see if over the course of the next two or three weeks, some of these more aggressive uh, treatments or diagnostic tests can um, identify the problem or um, make you feel better. Next slide. So these are things, when you get a, a acute back pain flare, um, and these are the things to ask yourself um, when you get that, um, is that do you smoke? So if you smoke and now you've had an acute back pain episode, <clears throat> what is it from? If it was your normal daily activity and you um, have acute back pain, um, you might want to consider stop smoking. That's something that you can do for your general overall back health in the future. Are you at an ideal weight? Um, again, so evaluate for yourself <clears throat> whether this is uh, maybe something that could potentially be helped with uh, getting some of the weight off the spinal components. Um, you all probably know this, but I just put an example out here of a body mass index is what we use to define normal weight and overweight and obesity. Less than a body mass index of less than 25 is normal. Um, and there, just give you an example. I just give you a, your, if you're five foot five and you weigh 180 pounds, you're in the overweight category. One more point and you'll be in the obese category. So that's something to be aware of. And if you're five foot five and you weigh 150 pounds, then you're right at the top limit of normal weight. Um, normal weight is up to 25. So again, that'll give you an idea of how much weight you're carrying and how much uh, weight the spine can take for your height. <clears throat> if you're interested in what your body mass index is, you just can go on Google and type body mass index calculator, put your height and your weight in, and it'll tell you what, what that is. Um, and then if you have an acute uh, back pain flare, you want to um, ask yourself if you routinely exercise. Um, if you don't, maybe it's time to start an exercise program once you heal up. If you do routinely exercise, then you have to make sure that you're doing the proper exercise um, in terms of uh, your age and your um, uh, uh, history of exercise. <clears throat> um, next slide. Uh, okay, let me stop here. I'll answer this question. Um, is it better to tilt your car seat back or keep it straight if you have low back pain? Now, that's a great question. Um, the truth is, I don't really know because it's hard to know how much you're tilting and what kind of car and how, you know, your seats are and things like that. Um, and really the truth is, and you know, it's, it's a bit of common sense, but what makes you feel better? Uh, if tilting the car seat makes your back feel a little bit better, then do that. If sitting upright makes you feel better, do that. And some people need to sit upright, but they actually put a pillow underneath their back or they have one of those car seats that has that lumbar support. <clears throat> um, that can really help. So you sit up a little bit and you get a little extra lumbar support. So um, those are things, again, to try in your car um, with you have low back pain. Bring a pillow with you one day, um, put the seat back a little bit, see what you do. And then it all depends, obviously, on how long your drive is. Um, some people can sit upright for a five-minute drive, but they cannot sit upright for a two-hour drive. Um, that might bother their back. So in terms of what's best for you, usually what I tell people is, uh, whatever has uh, causes the le least amount of pain is probably what's best for you. And that may be, um, may be different for everybody. Um, there's another question. Is there a conventional treatment plan for a late age uh, diagnosis of scoliosis for a normal weight female? <clears throat> a conventional treatment plan... Um, yeah, typically for scoliosis, um, and I'm assuming this is um, 
adult degenerative scoliosis, not you've had scoliosis as a child and you're just bringing it with you as, you're, as you age, but um, the spine can degenerate. And as we hit the age of 60 and 70, you can start to get abnormal um, curvature of the spine. Scoliosis is a S type curve of the spine. It's not straight up and down. If you look at somebody from the front, their spine will look like an S. <clears throat> and that comes from the disc degenerating, the joints getting overgrown and not working properly. Um, the muscles on one side pull a little harder than the muscles on the other. And over a course of years, um, it'll start to deform the spine in the natural alignment. <clears throat> so Again, a reason as you're in your 40s and 50s and 60s to exercise, have good posture, um, and, um, and, and try to keep the spine in its good alignment and the muscles um, strong equally so that you don't have these degenerative conditions, although they can happen even if you do that. So back to answering the question, is there conventional treatment for scoliosis? The most common conventional treatment for adult degenerative scoliosis is an exercise program if you haven't been on it and to stop smoking. Um, again, going back to some of the things we talked about at the beginning, if you don't smoke <clears throat> and you're routinely on an exercise plan, then there's not a lot of treatment other than um, probably some sort of uh, Tylenol, uh, you know, kind of medication um, things. Braces don't work very well. Spine surgery for degenerative conditions is uh, a lot of rods and screws to straighten up the back. Um, and that can be um, a long process as a patient to have that done. Um, so those are two things that I would highly recommend if you haven't done an exercise program with good posture, yoga, those kinds of things, and, uh, and stop smoking if you're a smoker. Um, <clears throat> so another question, what can you do to, uh, to find out where your right SI joint pain is coming from? You've tried chiropractic, massage, acupuncture, physical therapy, it doesn't go away. You don't want injections or pills. You exercise and stretch, <clears throat> you want the pain to go away and you've tried everything. Uh, you're frustrated because you can't get any answers. Um, there's a reason for the pain. Is there another test I can request? There aren't that many tests to request. Um, you're sort of getting to the end of your acupuncture and physical therapy. Um, and then the, the downside is um, if treatment would consist of injections or pills and you don't want that, then unfortunately um, there's not a whole lot to do. Injections may work and they may not. Pills work and they may not. Um, you don't know if they'll work unless you try them. Uh, but if that is something that you don't want to do, you're kind of running out of uh, <clears throat> uh, options. If you're at ideal weight and if you don't smoke, um, then you're really at a loss. Um, you know, you can try a different chiropractor. Uh, you could always uh, try another chiropractor. Um, but uh, there are sacroiliac joint belts. Um, it's basically um, like a... Uh, elastic uh, compression um, wrap that you put around your hips that can kind of prevent the sacroiliac joint from moving around very much. Um, <clears throat> there's sacroiliac joint fusions, but you have to, the insurance company won't pay for them unless you have 50% or more improvement in your um, sacroiliac joint pain with injections. So you would have to have injections to even have surgery. <clears throat> Um, I don't do those surgeries, so I can't speak to the risks and benefits uh, of the sacroiliac joint fusion. Um, but sounds like you'll need to get a little bit more aggressive with the, the therapies in terms of uh, invasiveness, such as injections, if you're willing to try it. <clears throat> um, and then, like I said, if you smoke or you're um, um, not at your ideal body weight, you might have to consider be aggressive with that treatment. Is there a SI joint specialist? Not here at Bay State, um, but you can call your primary care and they might be able to look around to find a sacroiliac joint specialist. 
Uh, okay. Um, what do you do for chronic back pain? Uh, next slide. So uh, chronic back pain, these things we just sort of talked about and been mentioning, you can help with smoking sensation, call your primary to help with a weight loss or an appropriate exercise plan. <clears throat> so the, uh, or a dietitian for uh, anti-inflammatory diet, some of the things we've been sort of talking about throughout this uh, lecture. Chronic back pain, if you have a history of cancer, um, some cancers can go to the spine. Um, I didn't mention this in the acute back pain, but obviously um, if cancer goes to the spine, it can collapse and you can have an acute flare of back pain. That again will be something that won't get better after a week or two um, and might get worse. So you'll be calling your primary care for that. And again, if you have a history of cancer, your primary care will know that. Um, and they will order an appropriate test for you to make sure that you don't have cancer that went to your spine. History of infection. Um, sometimes infection can go into the spine. It can eat away the bones. It can eat away the discs. It can cause a mass compression on the spinal cord or the nerve roots, and you can get back pain or, or uh, leg pain. Um, <clears throat> We see um, infection in the spine mostly with intravenous drug users. Um, and so what happens is they put the dirty needle in their arm, the bacteria gets into their bloodstream and then it goes into their spine. So it's very rare for a healthy, uh, normal adult to have an infection in the spine. Although it can happen if you have diabetic foot ulcers, non-healing wounds, or um, chronic urinary tract infections or um, chronic pneumonias or something like that. So something to think about. Um, if your chronic back pain worsens um, without an inciting event, so if your chronic back pain and you slip on the ice and your chronic back pain gets worse, then again, you go back to your ice and your anti-inflammatories and you try to get back to your, your baseline. But if this is just chronic back pain that's gotten worse without anything, you might want to call your primary care and see if there's something else going on. Um, or a change in your chronic back pain. So let's say your chronic back pain was like our gentleman who uh, asked the question earlier where it gets stiff when he uh, sits for too long and then when he goes to sit or stand, um, it's really painful. Well, so if that's what you normally have and then all of a sudden that no matter what, you've got this sort of sharp stabbing pain in the middle of your back um, that's worse with I'm making it up, reaching overhead, that's a change in your chronic back pain. And that might be something you wanna call your primary care and just mention to them. They may go back to things where they give you prednisone or anti-inflammatories or ice or uh, get an x-ray, uh, but that would be something to be aware of uh, if your chronic back pain changes uh, in character. Next slide. Um, these are things your primary care might do. If you have chronic back pain, they might refer you to physical therapy or pain management. <clears throat> they might give you some prescription medications like steroids or muscle relaxers. Uh, <clears throat> and um, they might order a CAT scan, that's CT. Uh, CT stands for commute, computed tomography. So CT of the spine, that's really good for looking at the bones or the MRI. MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging of the lumbar spine. Uh, that's a great machine that uses a magnet to um, show the soft tissues of the spine, like the discs and the nerves and the spinal cord. Uh, and uh, so those are the things your primary care may do. Depending on the results of any and all of these things, they may then send you to a spine specialist to have a better, um, uh, um, a, uh, not a better, a, um, uh, a specialist diagnose any of the um, abnormalities that they may see on the imaging. Uh, next slide, I think we're getting close to the end. Uh, when back pain isn't just back pain. Okay, so these are some of the things that we were kind of talking about earlier with some of the questions. Uh, when back pain isn't just back pain. So previously, we've been talking about just your, your back hurts, right? So your back or your hip or your 
uh, <clears throat> Uh, over the side, just one side, uh, all in the middle. So this is just back pain. But what happens when you have back pain associated with something else, like leg pain or numbness or tingling or weakness, uh, most of the time in the leg? This is an important thing to, to understand, which is spine surgery is much better for the leg symptoms than the back symptoms. And so the two slides I put up before with acute and chronic pain, and I say they're rarely surgical, it's because we can't operate, we can't. We don't usually operate on back pain alone because surgery on the back for back pain doesn't really get you what you want because um, now you're operating on an area that's inflamed and now um, a lot of the times um, unless it's a broken bone or uh, infection or tumor um, we can't really fix back pain with a back surgery what we can fix with surgery is a pinched nerve root or um uh, that's basically it. <laughs> surgery is meant to decompress or stabilize. That's all we do as spine surgeons. We decompress or we stabilize. Um, and that's what we do. Um, we decompress nerve roots and pinch nerve roots can cause um, pain down the leg, numbness or weakness in the toes or the feet or the legs. Um, and then we can stabilize. So if bones are moving in an abnormal way, we could put rods and screws in and stop them from moving. Nerve compression that causes pain down the leg is usually goes below the knee. Um, and so that's something to be aware of. If you have pain that just sort of goes into your buttock region and doesn't really go below the knee, it's hard for the spine surgeon to sometimes figure out if that's just referred pain from the inflammatory process or if that's truly a nerve that's getting pinched. Um, lots of people as they age and you get the aging spine, it has these degenerative conditions where on the MRI, every single nerve root uh, is, looks like it's getting pinched. And so it's really hard to figure out which one is causing the problem unless the pain goes below the knee. Then sometimes we can tell which nerve root is being compressed. <clears throat> And this last thing goes to our friend who's been asking a lot about the sacroiliac stuff. The only thing that can really mimic nerve root pain is this sacroiliac joint pain. Um, I think I have a picture that kind of shows you some stuff. So sacroiliac joint pain can take a long time to diagnose. It can seem like a nerve uh, that's being pinched. Um, and because it's a joint um, and we don't typically treat joints in the back surgically, it can be really hard to fix. Uh, so next slide. <clears throat> so here's uh, uh, nerve compression, and then we'll get to that other sl uh, slide with the picture. Um, so nerve compression, herniated and bulging and ruptured discs. Just so you guys know, some people use those terms interchangeably. So um, sometimes the radiologist will say herniated, bulging, ruptured, and you're asking which one, is it a ruptured or is it a bulging disc? Um, and some people use those terms interchangeably. And so um, it, don't fixate on the word if you see that in your MRI rep report, because sometimes it all means the same thing. Um, all it means is that it's, uh, it's not in the normal configuration when you were 20 years old. Spinal stenosis can cause nerve compression. St spinal stenosis is just um, a narrowing of the area for the nerves. And so um, that would be something where um, the nerves get pinched because uh, something is overgrown or bulged out. So a disc could bulge and narrow the space for the nerves or the joint could overgrow and narrow the space for the nerves. Um, and this is a typical uh, thing that can happen as we age um, and the, the joints don't work right. They get arthritic, they get overgrown, the muscles and the ligaments tend to kind of overgrow or bulge out or the discs start to kind of deteriorate and bulge out. And so spinal stenosis is usually almost always seen after the age of 40 or 50. 
um, and you don't see spinal stenosis from degenerative conditions in the young adult. Tumor can cause nerve compression. Trauma can cause nerve compression, a bone or an acute herniated disc. Infection we talked about. And then we also talked bit, again about the sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Um, that can, uh, doesn't necessarily cause nerve compression, um, but that'll be something that mimics nerve compression. Uh, MRI, if the lumbar spine is the imaging test of choice for us. If you can't have an MRI because you have a pacemaker or some sort of uh, metal in your body, there are uh, other options that um, you can consider a CAT scan with a dye injected in or um, some other scans that we don't use routinely. Next slide. So this is our sacroiliac joint. I just want to point this out, and I'm glad we have somebody that's been asking questions about it. Hopefully this will help. Um, so your sacroiliac joint is the um, joint that connects the sacrum to the ilium, which is that hip bone there. You can see that in the picture. It's a big joint. Um, it runs uh, probably, uh, I don't know, anywhere from six to 10 inches top to bottom. It's a big joint, and every time you take a step, your hip bone that's connected to your leg bone rotates and moves. And so every single step you take, you're rotating that um, hip bone onto the sacrum. And if that joint is inflamed, you can see how it can cause a lot of pain. Um, the bottom of that joint runs right near what we call the sciatic nerve, which is uh, every little nerve root in the low back connects together at the sacrum to form one big nerve as it goes down the, uh, through the butt and into the leg. And then into the leg, it'll branch out to all the different muscles and things like that. But the sciatic nerve is the one big joint or uh, sorry, one big nerve. And if the inflammatory process that we've talked about where you inflame one little thing and it starts this cascade and then all the ligaments in and around it get irritated, then you can have an inflammatory process where the inflammatory molecules will start to irritate the nerve. Um, and that's when you can get uh, pain down the leg from your sacroiliac joint inflammation. Um, again, it's very hard to diagnose. Remember uh, the beginning of the lecture when we looked at all those ligaments and where the muscles attach and things like that. And if you remember, all those muscles and ligaments attach to the hip and the sacrum and the vertebral bodies. Um, and so it can really be difficult to diagnose and really figure out what the problem is. Um, and then to treat, do you treat a ligament? Do you treat the joint? Do you treat the muscle? And that's where our friend here had gone through PT and acupuncture injections. And none of them are really working. Um, you know, how much is it the inflammation from the joint? How much is now transmitted to the muscle? How much is now transmitted to the nerve? How much of the inflammation is going to the ligaments? And so again, it gets really, really hard to treat when you have sacroiliac joint problems. Next slide. Treatment for nerve compression, kind of going back to the nerves again. Uh, medications, lots of doctors will, or the emergency rooms will treat you with a narcotic medication, uh, uh, sorry, Percocet, oxycodone, morphine. Those are uh, uh, narcotics. The truth of the matter is that narcotics are not good for nerve pain. They're good for what we call musculoskeletal pain. They help with the muscles and the bones and the ligaments, but the narcotics are truly not good for nerve pain. Um, <clears throat> and so although it may help some of the inflammatory process, it might not help all of it. Um, and then the major downside that we all know is the opioid problem in the country. Um, and the federal government has cracked down on all of us as um, medical providers in terms of what we're allowed to give and how much we're allowed to give. Um, and they regulate it. And if we do too much, they'll take our license away. And so unfortunately, um, people that may need it, that do well with it, um, aren't getting it. Um, personally, I think the pendulum is um, swinging to the side. We're not giving a lot. Um, 
It was where we were giving too much and now the pendulum's on the other side where we're not giving anything. And I think in the next five or 10 years, it'll kind of swing back to the middle where there'll be a good balance of who gets the narcotics and who don't, who doesn't. Um, so there are my thoughts uh, on that. Um, physical therapy can help with the nerve compression and truly um, a herniated disc, 80% get better on their own with a little bit of time and some conservative treatment. And so what we usually do for nerve compression from a uh, herniated disc is you get some pain medications, you get some physical therapy to help that inflammatory process of the muscles um, while the body is healing itself. Um, and 80% of the time within a couple of weeks to two or three months, all that nerve pain will go away. Pain management, um, they're typically anesthesiologists that specialize in pain. They give injections um, of uh, usually um, a local painkiller or a steroid. They can inject the joints. They can inject the muscles. They can inject uh, in and around the nerves. So they have a, a lot of things they can do for that. And then for nerve compression, you might be referred to a spine surgeon. Um, if it comes to that. There are orthopedic spine surgeons and there are neurosurgical spine surgeons. Um, we all do the same thing. Uh, we all decompress the nerve roots um, and um, um, stabilize the spine. Like I talked about, spine surgeons decompress and stabilize. That's all we do. Um, and the orthopedic guys and the neurosurgeons do it uh, the same. Um, typically, the orthopedic spine surgeons, um, their um, residency and when they're in training is very much geared to muscles, joints, ligaments, and bones, whereas the neurosurgeon's training is more trained in terms of nerve roots and spine and spinal cord and things like that. And so, even though we do the same surgery, perhaps the um, baseline um, sort of uh, focus might be on different things, um, but uh, spine surgeons are spine surgeons and we pretty much all do the same thing. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we're getting towards the end here. Uh, what can you do to have a healthy spine? We touched on a lot of this. Um, don't smoke, quit or don't smoke, don't vape. It's all the same thing. You're not getting oxygen where you should be getting oxygen. Um, ideal body weight, we talked about that. An exercise program. Um, and what I recommend if you're sort of in your 40s or 50s and really haven't done a lot of exercise and you're maybe had one or two episodes of acute back pain and now you want to prevent yourself from having some chronic back pain as you get into your 60s and 70s is start um, a, 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 an exercise program. Three times a week, 20 to 30 minutes. I mean, we've all sort of heard this. Um, walking is really um, amazingly simple and does a lot of stuff for you. So it moves the hips and the joints and the legs and the spine. You swing your arms, it gets some movement in the arms. It'll get the blood flowing. Um, you can have, you, you kind of need correct posture uh, to, to walk. Um, so your spine is gonna stay straight. I think if we sit at home on the couch, um, most of the time um, we don't sit upright on the couch. We kind of uh, scooch our butt forward and lean our back and we have this curve to the spine. Um, think about what you do at work or at home. If you read a book, your head is bent forward. If you're on a computer, your head is bent forward and your back perhaps. Um, if you're a construction worker or you uh, are a chef and you work or you're doing the dishes, you're leaning forward and bending forward. So think about how much of your day is actually spent with your spine sort of curved forward and your head looking down. Um, walking, your head's up uh, and you actually straighten your spine out. And that's good for all those little muscles that we showed at the beginning to keep them straight and working and not um, strained in a position where we're bent forward. Be very good for your joints to stand up straight. Yoga is very good. Um, part of yoga is standing up straight and elongating your spine. 
twisting movements um, in a controlled manner are very good for your spine. Think about how many times we twist during the day in a routine day, not a whole lot. Um, but if you can sort of start adding some twisting movements in the spine, um, twisting movements are really good for the bowels, by the way. So it can help with some constipation if you're, um, you know, getting into that or have that as a, as a problem. Um, stretching is always good and, and posture we just talked about. Good lifting techniques. Everybody knows that. You're kind of brought up with that. Um, don't bend and lift at the waist. You know, bend your knees, squat down, use your legs to lift things. Um, try not to twist and bend at the same time. Think about uh, how many people are at the counter fixing their sandwich and how many times you're, that's a, you're a little bit bent forward and you turn and to the side and you reach over to get whatever the salt or pepper shaker or whatever your drink or whatever. So you're kind of bending and twisting at the same time. Um, and although we never think of that as a way to deteriorate the spine over time or improper technique, um, it could potentially be. So things to think about. And then common sense, uh, like I said, you know, don't shovel the snow and then the next day um, get up at six in the morning and sit in the car for six hours. You know, that's really going to irritate your back. Um, so try to use some common sense with you, the back and the lifting and some of the issues that you may have in terms of uh, history of spine problems or whatever. Um, Next slide. Okay, so this, we're, we're at the end. Um, so we've got a couple more questions. Is it worth consulting a spine specialist for the back and the sacroiliac joint pain? Um, so the, the, the issue comes in in a spine specialist. And remember, uh, the spine specialists are, their job for the most part is uh, these days, I should say, is whether there's a surgical problem or not, right? So a spine specialist is basically a spine surgeon. Um, although you can find spine specialists that are physical medicine and rehab doctors, they deal with chronic back pain that's non-surgical. So the one thing to be aware of is is there, uh, do you have an MRI or a CAT scan? And does it show something that's surgical? If it's not showing something that's surgical, then you don't necessarily need to see a spine surgeon because what are they going to say other than I can't operate on you and uh, I have nothing surgical to offer. Uh, and then you're right back where you are before. So a lot of it will depend on what the MRI shows. Um, if there's nothing surgical to operate on, then the spine specialist you'll want to find is somebody that's perhaps um, not a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic spine surgeon, but perhaps a doctor that's called physical medicine and rehab doctor. They're doctors that can sometimes specialize in the musculoskeletal things, right? The joints and ligaments and things like that. Um, and that might be a better specialist for you if you don't have anything surgical on the imaging study. Uh, the next question is how long is the recovery after conventional spine surgery after microsurgery? So if by microsurgery, you mean like a herniated disc or just decompressing the nerve root, typically it's um, a day or, you know, overnight in the hospital um and uh, you're home the next day the back pain from the incision typically gets worse over three four five days sometimes so you have to be aware that your back is going to hurt um after you get home uh, and again that's the inflammatory process but most spine surgeons will give you some medication for the incisional pain Typically, there's a uh, period um, that can be anywhere from a couple of weeks to a month or so where they don't want you doing anything. Um, and remember, every spine surgeon is different, right? So they might have different sort of procedures about how they do things. So you'll probably have a period of maybe one or two weeks where they don't want you driving. They don't want you doing anything uh, more strenuous than maybe going for a walk or two. Um, 
lots of spine surgeons and depending on the kind of surgery you have may have lifting restrictions after surgery. Um, and so that can be anywhere from uh, one month to three months after surgery that they'll give you some lifting restrictions. Um, some may want you to go physical therapy, some may not. Uh, most of the time, if it's just a conventional disc, they will not send you to physical therapy afterwards. Um, so they're uh, most of the common things that are done. Um, and then in specifics, it's hard to know specifically how, you know, you would do because I'm not quite sure what the surgery would be. So I'm at the end of my lecture. Um, uh, any other questions that anybody has? I'm available for the next 10 or minutes or so. If you want to type in any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, we got another question. Um, yep. Very good. So um, Tom just is uh, thanking us and he's better equipped to speak with his primary care about his back issues. Um, and that's what I hope that I was able to give you all is just sort of a way that the maybe the spine specialists sort of look at back pain. Uh, we put it into categories of acute and chronic. Uh, we Try to figure out, is it leg pain and back pain or just back pain? Um, and these are some of the things that will direct your care. Um, I think the thing that I get most from people is the frustration with um, how long it takes to get things done. And um, the truth is, is that it is, it's frustrating. You're in pain. You don't want to be in pain anymore. Now it's weeks later. And then it's going to be another week until you be a specialist or another two weeks until you get the MRI and things like that. Uh, and it is a frustrating process. And um, unfortunately there's no good way to kind of expedite it. It's unfortunately the way um, the slow process works. Um, and so some of the things we talked about for you all to do at home to try to get yourself better while you're waiting for your primary care to, you know, giving you an appointment, um, some things that you could, can do. Um, another question, when is an MRI indicated? That's a really good question. Um, the MRI, <laughs> hate to get into this, but um, a lot of times it's dictated by the insurance company and I hate to say it, but it's true. Um, the MRI costs about $4,000 um, for most people. Um, and <clears throat> frequently the insurance companies are going to say, well, I'm not going to pay $4,000 for an MRI if you're going to get better in two or three weeks with physical therapy. So sometimes it's not necessarily when's an MRI indicated, it's really when is the insurance company gonna pay for the MRI? What do I have to do to get them to do that? Um, and so that, uh, as much as I hate to say it, can be part of the mix and maybe why you're not getting an MRI when you want one or your primary care has asked for one but the insurance company is denying it. Um, because they want you to get better with physical therapy in three weeks before they'll pay for an MRI. So when is an MRI indicated? An MRI is indicated when all those things you've done for your acute back pain have failed. You've rested, you've iced, you've quit smoking, you've lost some weight, and your primary care has given you a muscle relaxer, you've already gone to physical therapy, you may or may not have gone to pain management, probably not. Um, and then if you're not getting better within four or six weeks, or you're getting worse, um, and you've um, done at least physical therapy, and if you're not getting better, that's when the MRI is indicated. And most insurance companies will require physical therapy for four to six weeks before an MRI will be paid for. Um, and so that's sort of another way to think about it is um, 
is that it's probably going to be at least six weeks before you get an MRI between your acute back pain and your MRI. Other times when an MRI is indicated is what we call a uh, neurologic deficit. So if you have sudden loss of feeling to the leg, uh, the foot, something like that, or if you have significant weakness, so all of a sudden you can't lift your foot and it's slapping on the ground, you're more likely to get an MRI without physical therapy. That's what's called a neurologic deficit. You need to see your primary care, they have to do an exam and they have to document that. And if that's documented and somebody thinks, you know, your primary care thinks that that could be an indication of a uh, nerve being pinched, that would be an indication of uh, um, for an MRI. The only other indication for an MRI that as it relates to back pain is if you have an acute onset of your um, legs are numb and tingly and you are uh, losing your bowel and bladder, you're incontinent, that's actually an emergency and the MRI will get done because you'll be in the emergency room and then the emergency room doctor will get you an MRI immediately. So um, <clears throat> that doesn't happen very often and it's really not in the context of this lecture but that would be an indication for an emergent MRI, but that's through the emergency department, not as an outpatient. So that's all the questions that I have right now. Um, if anybody has anything else, please uh, type it in. I'll wait for, it's about uh, 7.15, 7.20. Um, I don't mind uh, hanging out and waiting for any questions for the next uh, 10 minutes if uh, anyone thinks of anything at the time or you need time to type it in. I can wait um, for about 10 minutes. I want to thank you all for your questions, some good questions. I apologize for not being able to um, answer specific questions about your particular um, back pain or leg pain. It's hard to be able to do that without um, a full story and some pictures. Um, and then I hope that this has been helpful in terms of getting a better idea of acute and chronic back pain and, uh, and things that you can hopefully do as you age, as we all age to um, have a healthy back. So thank you and I'll wait around for a couple of minutes. And on behalf of Health New England and Bay State Senior Class, um, we would just like to say thank you for joining us tonight. This is our first um, Zoom educational seminar. Thank you, Dr. Linus, for presenting um, and for answering all of those questions. You did a fabulous job. And um, to our friends out there, our Health New England members, our Bay State Senior Class members, our retirees, um, we just want to, Sue and I want to let you know we miss you a lot. Um, we wish we could do these events in person, and we cannot wait to see you again when it's finally safe to do so. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. Um, can lumbar nerve compression be the cause of leg cramping? Your pain and numbness has improved, but now you're getting random cramping. Cramping is a, so the answer is yes. Um, cramping is more associated more often with the diagnosis of spinal stenosis which is um, some overgrown um, joints and bulging discs, and it actually compresses all the nerve roots. And what happens with spinal stenosis is um, actually, because there's compression, you're actually decreasing the blood flow to the nerves uh, in that location in the back. And that results in some cramping of the legs or some people have their toes curl in. Um, and that's something that if you already had the pain and the numbness, then there's a chance you still have compression. You're getting better, but you might still have some compression um, as it relates to uh, not getting a lot of blood flow. Um, 
So that is possibly um, the cause of your leg cramping is whatever's going on in your back if you already have a diagnosis of that. Um, it happens in the arm and the neck too. You get some um, cramping of the hands and the fingers as well. There's another question. Is restless leg syndrome related to problems with the back? Uh, no. The answer is no. Um, I'm not a specialist on restless leg syndrome, but restless leg syndrome, my mom has it and my sister has it, so I'm sure I'm going to get it in the next couple of years as well. Um, but typically, restless leg syndrome is a nerve problem, but it doesn't occur because of compression in the back. Um, it typically occurs um, because of some degeneration in neurotransmitters um, the, as they relate to the legs and things like that. Um, so they use a nerve medication called gabapentin um, sometimes to help with the restless leg. That's an, uh, a medication that's specific for nerve pain um, that can be helpful but there are also some other specific medications um, as they relate to that. Um, and again, I'm not a specialist on restless leg syndrome, um, but very rarely with the back. Um, and it's certainly not anything that is um, part of spinal stenosis uh, etiology or part of a disc herniation. Um, question of how often should someone have a bone density test done? That's a great question. Um, and as it relates to spine surgery, we would only consider doing a bone density test if we're considering maybe um, a surgery where we're going to be putting rods and screws in the spine. Um, if you're just concerned about osteoporosis, um, you have a history of that, then that question is better for your primary care to answer. I can only speak to it as it relates to spine surgery. All right, it looks like that's the last of the questions for the night. Thank you again, Dr. Linus. Um, we really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to be um, here with us and to present this uh, great educational seminar tonight. And thank you to all of our attendees for um, joining us. And we cannot wait to let you know when the next one will be. Okay, thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Have, have, a, have a great evening. Great job. Thanks. Yeah, awesome job. Thank you so much. You're welcome.